and God's here. Let's be very careful not to breathe. <laughs> Well, good morning. I'll be honest, uh, pretty nervous this morning. I don't get nervous when I feel God. Uh, there's a whole lot of God hovering around this morning. I just get nervous what I might do to quench the Lord. Uh, I, I tell you, we'll be in Exodus 31. Like I said, I, I get really nervous in these situations. I don't want to do anything to, to grieve the Holy Ghost. Uh, but I'll give you the thought that's been stirring on my heart for a couple of weeks now. God's been preaching this to my heart uh, for a little while. I didn't know exactly when I was going to preach it, but I knew I was going to preach it, teach it, whatever you want to call it this morning. Uh, but I believe God has help for every single person this morning. And if all we accomplish is reading the scripture this morning, then that's all that needed to be accomplished anyhow. So Exodus 31, we'll read verses 1 through 11. Now you bear with me with some of these names. And uh, if you know how to pronounce them, you just raise your hand, I'll call on you, and we'll go right down the list. Verse 31, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him a holy ab, the son of Ahizamach of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. Now notice what God's fixing to command them to build. Everything that takes place in this tabernacle is extremely important. A lot of the things in the tabernacle are a type of Christ. So they're about to have a hand in building one of the most important pieces to ever be constructed. So we're going to look at this. The tabernacle of the congregation, that is a big deal. And the ark of the testimony, that is a big deal. And the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle, they are fixing to have a hand in God's mighty work. Let's keep reading. And the table and his furniture and the pure candlestick with all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture and the laver and his foot and the clothes of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. Verse 11, we'll pray and jump right into it. And the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee. Notice this, they shall do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, as it's been said, I do thank you for your presence. Yes, Lord. God, you didn't have to pass by this morning. You didn't have to manifest your presence. But God, we're sure thankful that you did. Now, God, I pray, Lord, you take your word. You expound upon it in the hearts and the ears of the listeners this morning. God, I pray you'd encourage them. And again, Father, Lord, I'm just going to trust that you know exactly what to do. God, we sure do love you. Bless the reading. Bless this time. Bless our preacher. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we see in the context that Moses is on Mount Sinai. Now, we realize as uh, those who study the Bible, if you don't, that's perfectly fine. We'll familiarize you. But Mount Sinai is where Moses got a lot of the, in, uh, the instructions for the tabernacle and the Ten Commandments. You'll realize that God met in a powerful way on Mount Sinai. So we understand that Mount Sinai is a key place. And what's taking place here in Exodus chapter 31, and really the whole, uh, really the whole Bible is a is a hinge off of Exodus. But we see that Moses is getting the instructions for the tabernacle. Now this is an interval between the law and the building of the tabernacle that Moses is up on the mountain, and as I already said, what he is building the instructions are for the tabernacle. That is very important. But the people are just as important. So when we get here, I want you to notice there are three classifications of people you will find Moses and the Lord spake unto Moses we realize that Moses is the leader Moses is the guy in the spotlight Moses is the mouthpiece of God in this text but then I see there's a second group of people and that is Bezalel and Aholiab these I would like to make the application they may not be the mouthpiece of God necessarily but they are people who hold important position they hold important position. And then lastly, notice here in verse number 6 of chapter 31. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make known all that I have commanded thee. Notice the third classification of people in this text 
have their name is not mentioned. You have Moses, his name is mentioned. You have Bezalel and Aholiab, their name is mentioned. But we see there's a third classification of people whose name are not mentioned. But I'm here to tell you this morning, they serve just as an important role as Moses, Bezalel, and Aholiab. Yes. Yes. Now, Coach Paulsgrove, the title for this message is called Know Your Role. I played for a man by the name of Coach Paulsgrove in high school uh, during basketball. He was a very, very smart man. We uh, had a very well-tuned team. We won a lot of games. And when I was in high school, I, I thought that he was doing a lot of things wrong. He would not let us play the way I thought we needed to be playing. We didn't have the freedom I thought we needed to have. And one of his key things was know your role. If you look at our spreadsheet, our first seven guys, nobody averaged more than 50 point, or 15 points a game, but yet we beat people by 30 to 40 points a game every single time. Our first seven guys off the bench only averaged a little amount, but we all worked together. Know your role. He was huge on role playing. If you have this skill set, don't try to be anybody else. Don't try to do anything else. Stay in your lane. And that's where the thought comes from. Know your role this morning. I want to let you know, you may not be up on the stage. You may not hold a position. But that third group of people who I do not know their names, but I promise you God knows exactly who they are. I believe firm in my heart when we get to heaven, we will realize who that third group of people was that played such a huge role in God's work. Know your role. I see there is the calling. There will be a calling. God has a specific calling designed for your life. Notice this. I have called by name Bezalel. I have called by name Bezalel. He didn't say I have randomly chose. I have just went any, many, many, mo, but I have called Bezalel by name. I'm here to tell you this morning, whatever it may be, for you men, God may call you to preach, he may not. For you women, God, he may have you teach, he may have you lead singing, he may have all these things for you, but God has a specific role designed specifically for you. There's a lot of preachers in this room, but nobody can preach like me. I cannot preach like Aiden. Aiden can't preach like Ethan. We all have a specific role. I'm here to tell you this morning you have a specific role and God will call you by name. You yes. say, now preacher, I don't know what it is that God wants me to do. I have no idea. I don't understand my talents. I don't know exactly what it is. If I were you, I would be getting on my knees in this altar this morning at the end of service, whenever it may be, and ask God to show you what that role is. Yes. There is nothing like being in God's perfect will, regardless of what God has called you to do. There is the calling. He called him by name, but then also notice uh, what the adversary will do. Now, it's not in this scripture, but it is in other parts of the Bible. The adversary will absolutely discourage your calling by one tool, and that's the tool of comparison. The tool of comparison. Can I tell you what the devil will love to do? He will come by Bezalel and Holy Abbas. Let's go ahead and just, we're just going to hypothetical here. And he will say, Moses has a whole lot more responsibility than what you have. Moses is probably a little bit more important than you. Why don't you just try to work yourself into Moses' role? Can I tell you, Moses may have been called to be the leader, but he could have not been the builder. And the builders were called to build, but they were not called to be a leader. You say, I have more knowledge than Moses. If that was the case, then I believe Bezalel or Aholiab would have been placed in Moses' shoes. You say, I have a whole lot more wisdom than some of the people in positions. Do you realize Moses did not choose these people, but God chose those people? I'm telling you, God knows who to select. Don't say, I need to be somebody else. If God has called you to be a Bezalel or a Holiab, be a Bezalel or a Holiab. If God has called you to be that third group who nobody knows your name, but yet you must be present for the work of God to go on, be that third group. Do not let comparison steal what God has called you to do. You'll realize that a calling may have different opportunities, but equal importance. A calling may have different opportunities, but equal importance. Yes. Now, I've recently picked up the game of chess. I am not great, <laughs> but I love it. I love the pattern recognition. I love the sounds of the things moving across the board. I, I, I love the game of chess, but again, I'm not good. Now, you have your pawns, which is your front line. You have your rooks, you have your knights, you have your bishops, and you have your queen, and you have your king. 
Now, the queen is the most powerful piece on the board, so she can move everywhere. The pawns can only move a certain way. The rooks can only move a certain way. The bishops can only move a certain way. And the knights can only move a certain way. Now, that queen, like I said, she can run the board. She can do whatever she wants. She's very powerful. She's a good piece to have. But what I've learned about the game of chess is that pawn, that front line that a lot of people overlook that are insignificant, if you play it correctly, it can be just as powerful as the queen. I felt God on that. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, that pawn can be just as powerful yes. as that queen if it's used in the way it's supposed to be used. Can I tell you, the pawn is a terrible piece if it's trying to act like the queen, but if the pawn does exactly what it's supposed to do, yeah. it's a powerful piece. A calling may have different opportunities, but it has equal importance. I see the call, and then I see the commission. We see here in verse number 3, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God Amen. in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Now just to give a little history lesson, when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, they did not work in this type of work. This was not their line of work. Now, they were slaves, no doubt. They had some labor. They did some things. But more than likely, they were probably working with the bricks. They were probably working with certain things. They were not working in cutting stones with gold and silver and brass. That was not what they were doing. So they had not been taught in this area. You say, I don't know if I can do this certain task because of who I am, what I know how to do. Honey, can I tell you, whatever God calls you to do, he will equip you to have yeah. what he does. God, if he commissions you to do something, I promise you, he will qualify you to do something. Yeah. God gives the commission. He will give the qualification. He filled them with the spirit of God. He gave them everything that he needed. And now, you may have that excuse and say, well, I just don't know exactly what to do. So I just debunk that argument. You say, I can't do nothing. I'm, I'm not talented. I'm not skillful. I can't do nothing. Let me just debunk that. God will give you everything he needs. Your second excuse to why you have not surrendered to God's will or about why you don't want to go further with God, you'll say, well, I'm an absolute nobody. I'm absolutely nothing. Can we take a time out? The last time God had something to do with nothing, he created the universe. If you were in a place and say, I'm absolutely nothing, can you buckle up and get ready because God's fixing to take you to places you've never been. Amen. God can use a nobody. But then I have scripture to back that up because we see that Bezalel is out of the tribe of Judah. We all know about the tribe of Judah. We all know that Jesus Christ came of the tribe of, uh, tribe of Judah. We realize that Judah is a tribe that God delights to honor. Yeah. That's what Bezalel is out of. But notice where the holy ads from. He's out of the tribe of Dan. <coughs> if I ask somebody to give me ten facts about the tribe of Dan, could you? Probably not. They are a less honorable tribe. Yeah. But yet God took somebody with no background, no recognition, no nothing, and said, I will make somebody out of you. Yeah. God will promote you from nothing, from a nobody, and make you a somebody. Yeah. God will take a zero and turn them into a hero. God will do that in your life. We see the commission. We see that God chose these people. But then lastly, God has given you everything you need to be you. Everything you need to be you. God has given you everything to do what God has called you to be. God will not call you to be anybody else. Can I tell you, you'll be miserable in life. This doesn't just apply in the church world. This applies everywhere. You'll be miserable in life if you try to be like someone else. If you try to do somebody else's role, you will be miserable. Lastly, you will find when you try to be somebody else, or when you try to step into a role that God has not placed you into that role, you will stick out like a sore thumb. So it's been several years ago. I haven't been preaching long. I, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, I got a phone call, and they asked me to do a funeral for a distant relative who I've never met. So there's red flag number one. So I said, well, you know, what, what's, what do I have to do? They said, just bring your guitar and show up. So all right. Now for you that know me, I play the guitar barely. What I've learned is from YouTube. So I wasn't good with that. So I, again, I was kind of uncomfortable with that as well. So I get there. 
And uh, somebody said, there's a certain man looking for you, a certain gentleman looking for you. I was like, all right, well, if you see him, because I don't know who he is, so I can't find him, but if you see him, tell him I'm here. So all of a sudden, here comes a man. So he said, you Luke Crow? I said, yes, sir. He said, you got your guitar? I said, yes, sir. He's like, praise the Lord. He said, man, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm officiating this funeral, and here's the agenda. Now, here comes red flag number two. It was a ripped out sheet. It wasn't even ripped evenly. It looked like he ripped it out and spit his gum in, and then somebody told him what he had to do. So it scribbled out. You could barely read. And at the very bottom of the sheet, I, I promise you I'm not making this up. It said, Luke Crow, special song, closing prayer. I am not lying. And for y'all who know me, I cannot sing. I can barely play the guitar. I looked at him. I said, brother, who told you I could sing? He said, somebody here you said you could sing. I, said, I looked him dead in the eye. I said, sir, they lied right through their teeth. I cannot sing. He said, well, can you play the guitar? And I said, yeah, barely. And he said, well, play something everybody knows. What does everybody know? Amazing Grace. So I said, let's do Amazing Grace. So then I'm caught with the issue. I have to sing. I have to play. The third red flag, well, we're probably about the sixth or seventh red flag, let's be honest. I'm lyrically challenged. Some people are vertically challenged. They do not grow tall. I'm lyrically challenged. I cannot remember lyrics. I can remember what was on the back of my Captain Crunch box in third grade on that puzzle and how I solved it, but I cannot remember the lyrics to the most popular song ever wrote. So I get there. We're working our way down the itinerary. We're getting down to me. So the guy looks at me. He says, is your guitar ready? I said, it's ready. So he gets to me. He introduces me. says what I'm going to do. Can I tell you the last thing that people want to do at a funeral is have a sing-along of Amazing Grace. But I had to have help. I can't sing. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. I'm trying to remember the chords of Amazing Grace. I, I really don't even know the song, if we're being honest. I can sing it in a group of people. You put me on the spotlight. I cannot sing. So we're sitting there. I strum the first chord. No intro. Just go straight in Amazing Grace. Nobody sang along. <laughs> it was just me singing. You can ask my mom. She was there. I'm telling the truth. I was just singing. So we come to that second verse. I, I don't know what it is. I'm waiting for somebody out of their, the goodness out of their heart just to help me sing. And they just kind of guide their way in. We never got to that point. So the people that did not sing that were humming, me later on in that second verse, I began strumming and just humming because I did not know the second verse of Amazing Grace. Nobody wanted to sing along. Nobody wanted to help join in. So I tell you what I've done. I said, I really feel that the Lord to pray. And that's what we did. I put my guitar up and we prayed. I'm, I'm telling the truth this morning. Can I tell you, I'm not a singer. I don't lead singing. I, I can't do none of those things. But yet somebody had forced me into a role that I was not called to do. Can I tell you? If you try to act or be somebody else in a role God has not called you to be, right. you will stand out like a sore thumb. I wish I could forget that, and I wish they forgot that, but tell you the truth, they probably have not. If you're trying to be like somebody else, you will stand out as a sore thumb. Be what God has called you to be. There is the commission, and then lastly, I, I close with the construction. There's a whole lot I want to say, but I'm just going to say this and step out of the way. The construction. You have the calling, you have the commission, and you have the construction. If you read on in chapter 36, from 36 to uh, uh, verse 4, or chapter 40, I'll just flip there and read it, verse 40, uh, verses 33 to 34, you'll find the construction, it was completed. Verse 33, and he reared up the court, round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That is so important. Yes, it is. When God fills a place, mm -hmm. he is pleased. Yes. He is pleased. You say, how did they get to that pleasing work? How did they construct the tabernacle? How did they do what God wanted them to do? They submitted 
what God called him to do. Do you realize that construction would have never have taken place? They could have never moved forward. They could have never experienced or seen the victories that God was going to give them unless they submitted. And I think what does God have in store for this church? Moving forward, construction, vision, whatever it may be, victory. None of that will happen and get off the ground if we first do not submit to what God has called us to do. Right. Know your role. I told you, you say, well, I'm in that third group. It's easy for you to sit here and say, just know your role. God's called you to preach. Listen, you realize that third group, when they gave to the work of God, they gave willingly. They brought in everything. They brought in the materials. They brought in the money. They brought in all of that. You realize Moses could have not had their instructions to give to build the tabernacle. Uh, a holy Adam Bezalel, they could have not had the materials to build the tabernacle unless that third group did not give. The people who are unnamed are key to the whole operation. If they would have not given, in Exodus chapter 36, there would be no tabernacle to build. There would be no materials to build. I close with you are important to the work of God. Do not let the devil tell you otherwise. You are important to yes. the work of God. Submit to God's will. I promise you are important. Preacher, I love you. I love you.